Hey there, and welcome back to the Parkinson's Disease Education Podcast. I don't know about you, but when I think of the term good vibrations, the first thing that comes to my mind is the Beach Boys. But in this case, we're going to be talking about some potentially good vibrations that could impact you as a person with Parkinson's disease. In this episode, we're talking about rife frequency and how this could be potentially something to look into for managing Parkinson's symptoms, maybe not. Either way, I hope you'll stick around until the end of this episode to find out a little bit more about it. That way, when we get to the end, we'll know if we're on the same wavelength. With that bad pun said, I'm going to go ahead and cue the intro while I'm ahead. See you then. Welcome to the Parkinson's Disease Education Show, where we demystify the disease and empower you as the person with Parkinson's disease to reach your true potential. The content contained on this show is for informational purposes only and is not meant to be a replacement for information or advice that you receive from your in-person medical or therapy professionals. If you haven't already, I hope you'll consider subscribing. And for an even more personalized experience, please ask us about our memberships. Now, without further ado, let's start the show. So we need to talk first about what rife frequency is. So the name rife comes from a gentleman named Dr. Royal Raymond Rife, who in the 1920s invented what was called a rife machine. So a rife machine is a device that generates low energy electromagnetic waves. And basically the theory behind his work was that there are certain resonant frequencies that could potentially help with some conditions, medical conditions. Rife believed that every microorganism, for example, bacteria, viri, etc., had unique electromagnetic frequencies in which they oscillate. We do know that human beings have electromagnetic fields, but I digress. So his theory was that by creating an electromagnetic frequency that matched a pathogen's frequency, so a pathogen like a virus or bacterium, that it would reach what's called the mortal oscillatory rate. The pathogen would then be destroyed. So essentially, think of it like breaking a a glass of wine with a high-pitched note from a trumpet. So the machine that he invented would basically deliver low-energy electrical impulses through either pads or tubes that are placed on the hands or feet. They still make rife frequency machines today, and some people with Parkinson's have used them and continue to use them for alternative versions of treatment. Now on the surface, that almost sounds like a plausible theory. Now, of course, with Parkinson's disease, we're not talking about a bacterium or any kind of a microbe. In particular, we're really talking about neurological damage caused by a very specific Uh, neuron problem in the brain, the dopamine producing neurons, and and the pathologies that lead to those being diseased and dying. So how does this apply to Parkinson's disease? Well, that's where the problem lies. There really is no specific evidence for right frequency and Parkinson's disease in terms of having any efficacy or potential to heal, uh, cure Parkinson's, or really treat the symptoms of Parkinson's. Now, I do want to dive into a little bit of evidence on what we do know in terms of essentially treatments that are legitimate frequency or electromagnetic research in Parkinson's disease that exists now and what can be said about those techniques. But also want to contrast that with right frequency, which essentially doesn't really stand on its own compared to some of these other treatment modalities. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that a little bit more. So what do we know what do we have available that we know has some research backing and we know to some degree that it can help in some way. First we have deep brain stimulation. The next would be pulsed electromagnetic field or PEMF. There's other electromagnetic therapies as well. Um, the, The third is vibration, acoustic, or sensory stimulation of some kind. There's there's several different ways that that can happen or that that can be done. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, give you some examples of those as well. Okay, so let's talk about deep brain stimulation first. So DBS is a very well-known treatment for Parkinson's disease. A surgical, uh, surgical treatment involving implantation of, of electrodes in, deep in the brain that stimulate areas of the basal ganglia cells that produce dopamine. So essentially the implanted electrode delivers continuous electrical impulses to the basal ganglia nodes. There's specifically two areas that are implanted most commonly, which is the subthalamic nuclei and the globus pallidus internus, STN or GPI for short. And basically that modifies pathological neuronal activity. So 
the what's thought to happen or what we know happens really is that those electrodes deliver a, a very controlled impulse of electricity that helps to regulate the area of essentially dysregulation. There's uneven and kind of faulty uh, nerve firing in that area. The DBS helps to stabilize that essentially. And how that's done is through high frequency, uh, typically around 130 hertz. Um, but there's also low frequency as well at 60 hertz, depending on the specific symptoms that the neurologist, the neurosurgeon is trying to treat with the, with the DBS. In terms of evidence, DBS has quite a high amount of high quality evidence and standard of care behind it. So for example, there are multiple large randomized controlled trials, long-term cohorts where they've looked at people over uh, longitudinal studies over years after their DBS implantation. There's all other kind of systematic reviews and so, such like that. So essentially there's uh, the findings show substantial durable improvements in tremor, rigidity, dyskinesia, and quality of life um, for people that were appropriately selected for that, that procedure to be done. Um, frequency tuning uh, specifically can target different symptoms as we mentioned earlier. And there's some evidence that low frequencies help more with things like freezing episodes and swallowing difficulties. Let's compare that with PEMF. So there's a couple of different versions of this, particularly transcranial pulsed electromagnetic fields or TPEMF, external pulsed electromagnetic fields. And essentially it's also intended to modulate neuronal activity, uh, help with neurotrophic properties. So in other words, helping the, the uh, support cells of the nervous system to, to help uh, protect existing neurons and potentially uh, heal the damaged neurons. Um, it also helps with anti-inflammation pathways. There is some variability in the protocols on those types of devices and that kind of treatment. Um, in terms of evidence, we have early clinical trials. There's some small randomized controlled trials and feasibility studies. It's kind of mixed evidence but it is at least promising in those small sample sizes that they've done thus far. Some of the trials on the PEMF have shown modest improvements in function, tremor coherence, or force production, and uh, the effects are more consistent in those who are mildly affected or an early onset of Parkinson's disease. Not early onset in terms, in, meaning young onset, but early in their diagnosis, basically. Um, and again, those are small samples. It's not yet a standardized therapy but it has more research behind it and more evidence behind it than RIFE so far. Let's look at the last one. The last one, uh, I kind of threw it together as one category, but essentially there's vibrotactile type of stimulation as well as things like uh, acoustic or auditory, so things like binaural uh, devices and beats and so forth. So we're gonna talk about those two separately. First, there's the vibrotactile stimulation. So one of the best examples in the last few years was the vibration gloves. Another that's out there is called the beach band. I wanna say most of the research has probably been done more on the vibrotactile gloves at this point. So the vibration gloves provide pattern vibrations to the fingertips or limbs. And essentially what they're trying to do, and in, in the words, uh, the exact words that I found through my research of this topic was to desynchronize pathological neuronal synchrony. In English, basically, plain English, what that would basically say is um, there's there are abnormal nerve signals going on in the damaged parts of the brain, like the basal ganglia cells, for example, and the vibration being patterned is helping to break up the abnormal patterns that are found in the brain because basically you're providing input from outside of the brain in the peripheral nervous system that then gets interpreted by the central nervous system and it, it kind of tricks it into thinking that things are normal. I'm not exactly sure of all of the uh, anatomy and physiology behind that other than the fact that the, the, the what we sense in our limbs, our hands and feet and so forth it gets interpreted in the brain. Um, and so um, I guess in some ways it kind of helps to balance things out to have that stimulus from outside uh, on the exterior part of the body on the, the extremities and the hands and feet. So the studies that have been done show high rate vibrations in pattern bursts. And that was 100 to 300 hertz range 
in terms of the the cycles per second and that was delivered in coordinated sequences basically there were sessions that they did daily for uh, several hours over days and weeks not specifically going into how many days and weeks and how many hours but these are very early studies so this is a pilot or early clinical studies with small cohorts um, and and they're just feasibility trials so it's very preliminary evidence and there's not a whole lot more than that at this point I guess some of the previous studies have been preclinical meaning they weren't on humans either so it's kind of at this point more theory than anything uh, or more hypothesis I guess than anything in human beings but there are reports of acute and cumulative motor improvements and tolerability, but meaning that people tolerated the treatment well, they noticed improvements in things like dystonia and tremor. Uh, but obviously we still need more trials to give it more robust proof that there is anything to it. Finally, similarly to the vibrotactile, there's acoustic and auditory treatments. So there's, there's thought that rhythmic auditory stimulation or binaural beats could help modulate motor networks in the brain um, through specific oscillations. So, uh, for example, gamma gamma band is around 40 hertz. Um, there's other rhythmic rates that can help with things like gait cadence, uh, gait speed, things like that. So, um, those again are small trials, just exploratory studies at this point. There's some evidence that um, motor improvement has happened with rhythm-based training or specific binaural protocols. Um, it can help with things like, uh, again, gait or freezing of gait, timing sometimes uh, it could be helpful for overall motor performance. There's a lot more work needed though to help standardize those protocols and confirm durability, meaning how long do those results last. Um, so that's about all we have in terms of other alternate versions of something like Rife Frequency. All that being said, if you go back to Rife Frequency for a moment, the proponents of Rife Frequency don't have even that much evidence behind it, not even preliminary trials or um, feasibility studies, anything of that nature. So all of it's anecdotal. The frequencies vary wildly in terms of what people said helped. So basically there are specific frequencies often talked about with Rife Frequency and that this particular frequency will help with Parkinson's. Um, but these are anecdotes and they're also commercial claims because let's face it, these people are selling devices um, for treating certain conditions and they're going to, of course, commercially, they're going to want to make it look good. That's not the same as controlled evidence as we talked about with some of these other treatment methods like DBS, which DBS among all the ones we talked about has by far the most evidence clinically and anecdotally. Okay, so let's summarize everything we talked about thus far. First, the number one thing I want to leave you with is that right frequencies have no credible clinical evidence, particularly pertaining to Parkinson's disease. So you may see a lot of claims out there about, well, 813 hertz or whatever it is, is the frequency for Parkinson's disease to help with all these different things. That may have been helpful for some people for some reason, but that doesn't mean it's going to be helpful for you. So just bear that in mind that there is no there's no consensus across the medical uh, community or professionals that this will do anything for you. Second thing is that if you wanna talk about frequency-based treatments, DBS is the strongest, most evidence-backed approach for helping persons with Parkinson's disease. Not everybody's a candidate for DBS, but those that are really, really have had a lot of benefits from it when it's worked well and and they're a good fit for the surgical procedure. That's a more invasive treatment for the non-invasive approaches like the PEMF, uh, vibrotactile and acoustic approaches, for example. All of those are areas of active research and there's promising results for some symptoms, but it's still early evidence, it's still preliminary evidence. Uh, it's worth looking into, it's worth following, but it's not also something to necessarily jump into to help your symptom management. And again, as I said before, if someone's asking what frequency should they use, um, there is no single validated right frequency for Parkinson's disease. So um, you'd be hard pressed to really find any one recommendation for that. So what's my opinion about all this? Well, honestly, in my 
13 years of helping persons with Parkinson's disease in the field of physical therapy. I've, never, I've yet to have one person use one of these devices. And the only reason I really brought it up uh, in any episode on the, on the YouTube or the podcast is because I've been asked about it multiple times and asked what my thoughts were about it. So in short, at least on my, in, on my part, rife frequency, rife with doubt, at least in my personal opinion. That's about all I probably can say at the moment about rife frequency or rife devices and in terms of how it directly pertains to Parkinson's disease. Let me know what you think and if you've used one of these devices or have a loved one that has and has found benefit from it. By all means, don't take this as my demonizing this treatment method or from trying something to help yourself or to help a loved one. But I do want to hear your opinion on it, so I do welcome that in the comments section. And I do hope that uh, you will provide me with other evidence. If I haven't been able to find anything that's promising, I would be uh, more than open to that. I'm going to do my best to put links to pertinent research behind this in the description or the show notes, and uh, that way you can do some of your own research as well. With that, we're going to conclude. I really appreciate you all watching. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, share this episode with anybody you think might benefit from this information. And uh, if you're listening on audio only, please don't forget to follow the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. Catch you the next episode. Be empowered. Have a great day.